Welcome to episode 36 of the Pit Box Podcast. Now, as you see, there's three of us today, but we have a special guest. Now, this guest just happens to so be a, you know, Aston Martin factory driver for this year. Last year, he won the Nürburgring 24 with Frickadelli Racing. He also was a former Nürburgring track record holder in race in an M6 GT3 car. Coming all the way from currently in Germany, but he's from the UK, David Pittard. Hey guys, how's it going? If I had a soundboard, I would do the round of applause, but you know, maybe that's (laughs) for for next year. Come on, on, guys, we can can get it together here. Make our own sound effects. Yeah, don't destroy the 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 ears of the listeners. <laughs> so, uh, where are you at right now? You're in Germany. What part of Germany are you? Uh, so I am about uh, hundred, well, eighty kilometers south of uh, Cologne, probably to be very specific there. Um, yeah, in the Eiffel region, which is the same region in which the the Nürburgring is. Um, the same sort of set of hills that Spa Francorchamps is as well. So. I'm an hour from the spa, spa Frankenstein. I'm an hour from Nürburgring. Uh, yeah, dreamy, dreamy place to be. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And how's the off season going for you so far? Uh, yeah, really, uh, very exciting actually. Uh, pretty much since I came back from Road Atlanta, which was my last race last year, um, my girlfriend and I bought a house in the middle of the summer. And then as soon as it came back, it was like full gas working on that to get it all ready for Christmas was the was the deadline, which we just about managed to do. We moved in uh, the weekend before Christmas. We then hosted Christmas dinner for sort of uh, uh, a family. Uh, and then we had a big uh, New Year's Eve party as well. So now beginning of January, it's kind of like now we feel like we can start to enjoy the the house for ourselves rather than sort of preparing it for party season and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, it's been quite full on as a result of it. Um, yeah, getting my hands dirty in, in, in some slightly different ways, which I haven't done so much uh, before. Um, but, yeah, now we're, I think we're settled in. And uh, yeah, very excited uh, for 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 to, to to be here. So hopefully, the next time you come on the podcast, you will have like some crazy room, kind of like how Tom Christensen does, where he got all the <laughs> helmets and trophies and stuff. And then yeah, yeah, yeah. In the background, you know that that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> but you know, I was thinking, I was thinking, well, how what's what's the best background to do to do this? Uh, but. Uh, so we, we've got, we've got an upstairs and a downstairs and upstairs is kind of our, our living area. And that's, that's not been my decoration domain. So I'm allowed one trophy up here and then everything (laughs) else is downstairs. So, but it's quite comfy here. So, and my, I've got like a gym room and stuff that I've, I've made. That's going to be my, my little man cave. And that's pretty much functional, but yeah, it's not looking super pretty yet. So yeah, next time I come on, hopefully it will be functional and pretty. Yeah, yeah. And I can already think of the one trophy you probably will have. Uh... Yeah, easy decision. <laughs> Very easy. <laughs> but um, all right. So not everybody is uh, as familiar with your past as we are. Mm-hmm. It was just a little bit of how you got to this point. Uh, yeah, so I've been involved in motorsports um, oh, yeah, for over 20, 24 years coming up now, I would say. Uh, and it was all my dad's fault. Uh, that's how it all started. Um, he's always been a massive fan of motorsport. He's always been um, an avid spectator. Um, he always used to um, yeah, go to the Grand Prix back in the day, the British Grand Prix, the European Grand Prix at Brands Hatch in the 70s. Uh, Zamvoort, uh, I remember him telling me sort of the stories there where he uh, he was out on a scout trip towards the Netherlands and then suddenly he heard race cars and, and kind of looked over the, the sand dunes and, and there was the Dutch Grand Prix sort of happening. Um, and... Yeah, so it was all his fault. Uh, he was into motorbikes, into cars. He took me to to races, the Formula One and Silverstone. And uh, yeah, it got to sort of eight years old and I did well at school. My parents asked me what I wanted to do. And um, yeah, I said go-karting naturally. And I think I had to lie about my age because yeah, it was eight years old was the minimum age. And I was like seven and 
seven and 11 months or something like that. And, uh, and yeah, just started doing a bit of go-karting our local go-kart track in Letchworth uh, in Hertfordshire in England, just north of London. It's probably, you could probably say it's the same indoor go-kart track that Lewis Hamilton started at. Uh, he can, comes from the next town down, which is Stevenage. And uh, so the rumours are told uh, that he started indoor go-karting there as well. And uh, yeah, I did quite well in some practice sessions. The guys who were there said, oh, you should sort of come back to the Sunday league that, that they used to host there. And yeah, that was the next sort of 18 months or so. So um, where I was racing on Sunday mornings um, from yeah, eight to about 10-ish. And then from that club, it was uh, a group of us all went outdoor go-karting where uh, I was fortunate enough to yeah, get my own Rotax go-kart, uh, get my proper race license, etc. cetera. And, uh, and then Kim Bolton Kart Club was my local kart circuit where I started in Minimax when I was uh, yeah 11 years old, it would have been. Um, and yeah, did five, six years of Rotax karting up until I was 17, mini max, junior max, senior max, um, racing predominantly at club level, um, doing the O plate championships, the kart masters Grand Prix at PFI every year. Uh, and then I remember one Christmas, my dad got me, he gave me this envelope for Christmas and it was an entry form for the brdc stars of tomorrow which was like the national championships for junior max and uh, we did two years of that which was mega i finished like, top 15 top 10 in the country there um yeah i was never super super good in karting i was okay um but yeah when you look at some of the other people i was kind of uh up against in driving uh, i think they were potentially a bit better than me at karting at least anyways and then, yeah, karting was getting so expensive, we decided to go car racing. Uh, just through some sort of friends of uh, family, uh, we were introduced to uh, a single Toyota MR2 racing series. So it was a 1980s car um, that, again, my, it, was, it was always been my dad uh, and myself, so dad and lad sort of racing. My dad was an engineer um, earlier on in his, his working career, uh, which means he was always on the spanners and preparing the cart uh, and the car. Uh, of which I would get involved in as well. I was never hugely interested in the preparation. I just wanted to drive all the time, but I still learned and got a good appreciation of uh, the work that needs to go into um, yeah, a race, a, a race winning go-kart or, or car. Um, and yeah, hugely thankful for, for him and his input. He, he, he loved it as much as me. And uh, we spent some good times together traveling up and down the UK uh, into Europe um, all together um, yeah in in those in that period as well so yeah that got me into car racing uh, when I was sort of 17 18 I also started university at the same time so I was kind of doing uh, both things at the same time um, and yeah then then I did two years of the MR2 racing uh, then I did uh, what did I do after that? Then I got into Brit Car, which is like a British Endurance Racing Championship, effectively. That's what it's called these days, BEC. And uh, I drove a Porsche Cup car there. Uh, so that was a big step up uh, from the sort of 120 horsepower, 900 kilo car the MR2 was into, yeah, big three, 400 horsepower Cup car. Um, it wasn't the most competitive championship, but we did win the championship. So it was nice to get on the CV. That was uh, back in 2022. Uh, sorry, no, 2012. Sorry, God, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> going going back quite a few years there. Uh, and then yeah, off the back of that, I had my sort of British Championship, uh, and then I got on the Ginetta ladder. Ginetta is a British sports car manufacturer, uh, and they they've done a lot for the British um, motorsport industry. They have a, a ladder system of their entry level G40 car, which is also the same car that the Ginetta Junior Championship races. Uh, and then they that you could have gone from Ginetta Juniors in the G40s um, all the way up to Le Mans, potentially. Uh, they offer that that ladder, uh, which was really cool. So yeah, as you kind of mentioned, uh, I've always been sort of had my heart focused on tin top racing, so uh, touring cars and GT racing. I kind of grew up in the Schumacher era of Formula One, uh, where him and Ferrari just absolutely dominated. And I didn't find that type of racing, I suppose, hugely stimulating, which is why I looked towards, I think, tin top racing as where I would get the most enjoyment out of. And uh, I think looking back on it now, it's, it's, it's arguably the better career path as well. 
certainly the cheapest way to get into sort of professional motorsport as well, even though nothing is cheap in motorsport. But yeah, when you look at the, the budgets for single seaters, it's, it's pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, that was 2013, 2014. Again, Ginetta GT4 Championship. Uh, I was selected to be part of the Tesco, which is a massive supermarket in the UK uh, backed um, scholarship okay. scheme. I've, I've been Tesco before when I, when yeah. I took to, to england <laughs> yeah you would have done they're everywhere yeah <laughs> it's, it's it's huge i don't know what the equivalent could be uh in in america maybe like walmart or something like that but uh yeah huge superstore which got involved in in motorsport and um that was headed up by british touring car legend jason plato uh he's a legend not only yeah. on the track but also off the track as well as a uh, incredible personality but also as a, a businessman and a marketeer so I, I learned a lot of um a lot of things from him of the to become a professional really that was the that's what i really got from that year i, I could drive that was fine we never had to speak about the driving bit it was the the business side of things in which um and which motorsport is so um yeah, learned a lot there in 2014 season. Finished second in the championship, uh, the GT4 championship, which was cool. It was kind of a sprint GT4 championship uh, back then. Uh, then I think what's quite, I suppose, fairly unique about my career is that in 2015 and 2016, I actually had no money to go racing. So I couldn't do any championships. I could only do the sporadic one-off races here and there. I focused a lot on coaching in those times. Um, of which I uh, was able to stay relevant and stay at racetracks and stay networking, um, which I think helped me going forward. And um, yeah, it was a tough couple of years. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. It kind of, I think, made me those those sort of hard times that I never gave up. I always had the focus on what I wanted to achieve. By this point, I was fully focused on um, uh, obtaining a GT uh, career because I could see that's where the, the best career possibilities and, and potential was versus touring cars or single seaters, for example. Uh, and that, that led me to, to then join the British GT Championship with Lannan Racing and teammate Alex Reed in GT4 again, dri driving a Ginetta. We ended up P3 in the championship, which was good. We were in, in it to win it, uh, going into the final race of the championship, but unfortunately a crash uh, stopped us from yeah, challenging for the championship. Uh, and again, I kind of, in those two years, I, uh, I earned money in a normal job. I'd graduated university in 2014. I started working at McLaren Automotive, actually. So McLaren Cars down in Surrey. I worked in the really cool uh, McLaren Technology Center, that sort of James Bond lair looking building. Um, and yeah, pretty much saved up all my, all my money in those two years, uh, plus some sponsorship as well to invest into the 2017 season. Uh, but yeah, when it came to the off season in 2017 to 18, again, I had no money because I spent it all and I didn't have enough mon money to make that next step. Fortunately, I did meet uh, an amazing guy that was able to fund me into GT3 racing. We got some advice from Frank Stipler, who's an Audi works driver, uh, a bit of a legend around the Nürburgring as well and, and within Audi. And uh, we we said, um, I just I feel like I've got everything I need to get out of GT4 racing. I haven't won a championship or anything like that, but I've proved my potential, my pace, um, the fact I could lead a car um, and challenge for a championship. There's no there's no point in coming back and doing GT4 again just to kind of win the championship. I wanna I wanna get into the professional ranks as soon as possible. And uh, yeah, he said, uh, yeah, you need to come to the Nurburgring then. You if you wanna get the attention of the big German manufacturers, Audi, uh, BMW, Mercedes, and Porsche. Then you need to go to their back garden and, and uh, see what you can do, basically. Uh, so, yeah, that's, well, that's then what led me to coming to Germany and coming to the Nürburgring, basically. Okay. And uh, I struck up a deal with... Uh... Sorry, do you want to ask a question? Yeah. I was going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> Hold on one second. One question that I actually have for you. Now, yeah. before we before we delve into the, the Nürburgring portion of the story, yeah. if, do you feel that if when you were a kid, if maybe Michael's dominance wasn't so strong or just overall the field was more competitive, 
Do you think that might have actually made you want to race single seaters more than doing GT cars? And then if hmm. you make that decision, how would your career have possibly been different in the early days than what it was? Yeah, yeah, interesting, Phil. I've I've thought about this a few times. Now I know what I know. I, I, my dad wasn't like a racing dad who who knew the industry or anything like that. But if I were to sort of go back to my younger self and advise myself differently, um, yeah, maybe I think a couple of years in single seaters is definitely beneficial for your speed. The level of competitiveness in the entry level for, uh, formula uh, single seater championships, I think, is a very good uh, grounding um, to to take you into sort of professional motorsport anywhere really uh they are pure race cars you you really get a feel for for the car the engineering behind them and the competitiveness as well i mean um what i always remember from when i was karting is i loved the racing i was not someone that loved to qualify on pole and just romp off into the distance and take a race win i love that so i love starting at the back and i loved overtaking everyone and, and getting to the front so your to answer your question, the thing I loved the most and inspired was inspired by the most was the racing. I love going door to door with people, and um, that's why it, initially I wanted to be a touring car driver because of the racing. Uh, the British Touring Car Championship um, was was just an, an epic um, watch every time because it really was. You yeah, they're taking the wing mirrors off every corner basically, and it was just great to watch. So I think, yeah, I don't think I'd probably change what I'd done because that's what I love the most. It's the racing, it's the door to door. And that's what you get the most with single seater uh, with touring cards and GT cars. Single seaters, there's so much aero, even back in the days when I was growing up, that you couldn't really follow to be, yes, there's some hard racing. My favorite driver back in the day for Formula One was uh, Juan Pablo Montoya because he was the only guy that could bring it to Schumacher and he was just <laughs> so aggressive. He was just, he was a racer as well. And again, I took inspiration from him that, yeah, I want to be like him. I want to be a racer. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I think, yeah, the racing is what I love the most. Okay. Cool. All right. Now, have you ever yeah. had a chance to meet Juan before? Say again? Have you ever had a chance to meet Juan before? <laughs> Do you know what? I bottled it. I, uh, I was in Bahrain in 20. 20 i think it was and i think he was there with his son or they were doing they were doing the rookie test or something like that and i saw him and i was just like no nah, i can't be that fan guy i can't i can't do it so i know i bottled it i bottled it <laughs> but i think if i saw him again i'd i'd, I'd at least want a selfie because yeah he, he was the man back in the day yeah that'd be a move so it's so you obviously have like uh, a lot of experience between different classes of cars uh, and different experience racing uh, I just wanted to know uh, what were some of the challenges uh, of advancing between those different classes, like getting adjusted, uh, you know, learning, you know, new platforms. Uh, mm. What was what were some of the, uh, the the biggest challenges for you there? Yeah, so I remember, I mean, starting from the beginning, going from karting to to cars. The big thing there is the fact you've got suspension and weight transfer. Um, mm. I remember driving one of the first race cars I drove. Um, I had an instructor alongside me and I was driving this 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 car like it was a go-kart. I was trying to flick it around everywhere, but just with the <laughs> momentum that the the weight brings, you can't do that. So that was a big ad adaptation is, is having to really have that smooth technique, which I think, yeah, smooth kart driving and karting really emphasizes itself when you then come to cars because that's what you really need. Um, but yeah, I've always been, I think, quite a quick learner especially with motorsport i have that engineering uh, passion and interest as well that's what i gained my degree in uh, i get that from my dad both of my granddads as well so there's uh, that that interest in in anything mechanical so i think having that understanding of what's happening underneath me with the whole uh, suspension system the drivetrain um, everything that makes up uh, a race car or a car having that sympathy and understand what I'm working with has helped me going forward. Definitely. And, um, and yeah, it sounds funny, but I think just having an absolute obsession with racing, that's what I've had the whole, my whole life. Uh, any drop of information that I 
feel that I can learn to get better or increase my understanding. I've just absolutely fed off of it every single time. And uh, just a, com and a complete will and desire to improve and, and be the best that I can be. And then seeing where that leaves me in the, in the rest of the field, basically. So, um, yeah, that was one of the big things. I remember another big step was going from the sort of production race cars that I was driving with, yeah, a few 120 horsepower to then driving the Porsche for the first time. The power wasn't the wasn't probably the 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 biggest adaptation. It was it was suddenly the braking. It was suddenly dealing with these huge great slicks that you had, huge yeah. great brakes, and uh, that was a big learning curve as well. Um, I did my best to do what I could on the sim, uh, but yeah, even back in the day, obviously sims have come on so much more, which are available to the commercial market these days. It give you an idea of what is expected of you in a proper car. But um, I remember the, those those having to learn on the job with those um, was 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 one of the big steps I had to make. Aero uh, as well. So GT4 car has a, a the Ginetta I had had a had a pretty decent amount of aero. It's very light. Um, so that was one of its strengths versus maybe the McLarens that I was racing against that were a bit more um, stop uh, point and squirt. We describe it as where you just get it stopped, get it turned. And then fire it back out again. Whereas the Jetta was all about momentum and carrying uh, mid corner speed uh, and, and use, uh, using the aero, which then helped me going into the GT3 cars, which is a combination of power braking and um, uh, and that mid corner speed as well. They're just such capable machines. There's no there's no compromise in them. I remember like yeah, if you drive a GT4 car, you have to compromise how much turning and braking you can do, turning and accelerating. That kind of goes out the window with the GT3 car because they're so so capable, um, uh, such capable machines. So yeah, uh, like I said, uh, a obsessive passion uh, for both driving and probably the mechanical interests of of the cars and what's expected of the driver to to maximize them is probably how I overcame those differences to answer your question. Okay. So now to resume uh, with the timeline, uh, you now have made the decision that you're going to follow through with going to the Nürburgring and mm. hanging your hat there. Yes. Yeah, so I had this amazing opportunity where, yes, I had the funding to... Um, to 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 pay for my seat um and and learn gt3 and i remember that season i was thinking i don't know how good i am versus all of these professionals i believe in my ability i believe i'm good but i don't know if i if i can take it to these guys and it was almost like a sink or swim year because i thought i will either, yeah i will either swim and i will continue on my sort of progression of learning and uh, uh and and becoming closer to the guys that I wanted to 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 be, uh, I think at that time, like I had heroes in uh, Sean Edwards was absolute legend. Uh, I love the fact that he could just jump in anything, Porsche Cup cars, GT3 cars, uh, anything. He was a bit of a specialist around the Nordschleife as well. Um, I wanted to be like him. Lawrence Van Tor also was a was a hero of mine as well. Just again, I just loved his speed and ability. And I remember in I think it was twenty. Was it 18 when he set the qualifying lap record i just watched that youtube on board so over and over again because i was just like wow this is amazing this is incredible and um and yeah and then suddenly i was on the grid with these guys and it's well, unfortunately i was not sean rest in peace but uh yeah i suddenly i was i was on the entry list with with Lawrence fans i was like holy holy holy, <laughs> holy moly this is crazy um and and yeah again i had this uh vulcan horse were very good they could kind of see the, my my desire, my 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 wanting to to suddenly to 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 be up there and and see where I was at and see how good I could be, but um, the Norge life in a GT3 car, my first ever time, I'd never driven, I never tested the GT3 car anywhere else. It was a few laps on the Grand Prix circuit in the morning and then onto the Norge life in the afternoon, and. Um, they they did well to kind of keep me reined in really i was in a pro am car so i shared with two other gentlemen drivers which was another way in which i actually got on the grid it wouldn't have been possible without having to share with some some amateur drivers and um 
yeah, as a result of it, we were never, I was never fighting directly with these pro guys. I was, I was, um, I'd be a half a lap down or whatever like that, where I could kind of learn the race, the track, the car eh, with no pressure from a car behind me or, or something or, or having to go door handle to door handle, which was a very good way of, of easing my way into, um, GT3 racing and GT3 racing at the Nordschleife as well. But again, same approach. I just uh, hung off of any word, any bit of advice, any data that my engineer, other drivers, uh, my friends could give me and put that into just an approach of yeah, trying to apply everything, taking taking information and what I knew I could apply, what things I could yeah, immediately apply, things I had to build up to and just taking um that that approach just kind of letting it come to me rather than trying to push it or pu push beyond my ability because yeah it's a scary place <laughs> and it's an expensive car uh my whole career i've never had the um the luxury of being able to shunt cars or anything like that so that was always in the back of my mind as well so yeah uh, that happened for two race weekends effectively where again just learning 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 and then yeah, I got the opportunity. I remember sort of asking my team boss, I was like, uh, team manager, I was like, can I do the qualifying shot? Can I do the qualifying attempt? Which always comes at the end of qualifying uh, at the Nürburgring. The the fastest drivers are all in the cars at the end of the session. Some cars have sort of called it a session and, 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 and parked themselves in the box. So there's not so much traffic as well. Uh, and that's when the quali shot is. And yeah, they gave me low fuel, new tyres. And I went out and yeah, I put it... I, the the main aim was sub eight minutes for the the VLN circuit, um, which is a goal in itself, which I managed to achieve. Uh, but it also happened to be pole position for for that race for that day. And uh, I remember my yeah, engineer telling me uh, that that was pole position on my second to last lap. And then on the very last lap, there was a code sixty, so everyone everyone lost thirty seconds in the code sixty zone, uh, which is a slow zone, uh, which confirmed my pole position. And it allowed me to just sort of enjoy that final lap where I didn't have to push further or anything like that. And I remember I was like screaming my helmet, like, Gabba! like yes, I did it. I did it. I did it, which was incredible. And uh, yeah, my team, it was a good celebration afterwards. They were on the TV and uh, the, the TV came and interviewed me. They were like, who are you? Who's David Pittard? So tell <laughs> us some more about yourself. And that was kind of the theme of the day, really. I, my team boss was getting texts saying, "Who who's David Pittard? And why is he on pole? Like, <laughs> what happened for this for this phenomenon to kind of happen yeah. and that really put me on the map i felt that was my that was my the the moment where i thought i can do this like this this was confirmation in my mind that the doubt i i the doubts i, I previously had that uh yeah it was it was possible and yeah then i continued on that that learning and growing path with Volkenhorst. um the following year i was upgraded to their pro car to drive alongside their pro drivers, which then continued my learning where I was, I was driving against the pro guys and having to learn to race against the pro guys. Um, we won the Nürburgring qualifying race, which was really cool. Six hour race. Uh, so that was the first big, big result, I would say, uh, on the Nordschleife as well. Um, I also was able to drive Spa 24 that year. So that then introduced me to the SRO group, uh, the Pirelli tyre um, and the Blancpain series, which it was at the time. It's, it's now the Fan Attack fenatech gt world challenge um and then 2020 was a big year for me as well um again i kind of stepped it up again to be part of the Vulcanhorst g uh intercontinental gt world challenge crew as well uh again i was still a customer driver at this point i was getting i was getting a good deal but i was still having to bring a decent chunk of money to the team to pay for my seat uh, but i was able out of the two cars and the six drivers I was the only non-factory driver within the lineup. So I was, again, I was able, I was suddenly not only on the same entry list, but I was on the same car as legends like Augusto Farfus, um, Martin Tomchik, Nick Yellily. Um, and then there was a rolling, a, 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 a Nicky Katzberg, sorry. And then there was a rolling driver, like Sheldon van der Linde, Philip Heng, uh, and uh, Chaz Mostert, for V8 supercar legend. So suddenly I was yeah, in the same garage, in the same team as all these guys, which um, had been professional drivers for a long time uh, and legends in, in their own right. So that was a, another huge learning experience for me. 
Um, and again, these I was just feeding, feeding off every word that these guys were saying and just wanting to wanting to to try and replicate what they were doing and uh, be as good as they are. So, yeah, it was a, an amazing learning experience with Volkenhorst um, that then came into 2021 as well, where, again, I shared with Marco Whitman and Sheldon Vanderlinde, two DTM legends, two legends of, of BMW brand as well, um, of which I learned a lot as well. So, yeah, I very I count myself very lucky that I was able to have such access to such quick guys, and that certainly helped the the learning experience. It was it obviously made it very steep, and the challenge because when you're sharing the same car as these guys, there's nowhere to hide. There's no excuses to be made. Uh, you have the same equipment, therefore you should be able to match them. Uh, the only difference was was my experience level. So um, being able to yeah be alongside them was 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 incredible. And yeah, that pretty much brings us back uh, then into I suppose the modern day, as it were. The the um, uh, the past couple of years, I've, I've then gave me opportunity to come to to Aston. Yep. But before we get there, let's not need, let's not leave the Nurburgring just yet. Okay. Okay. When when I came across you, it was from watching like Misha's videos uh, at the Nurburgring, and yeah. one of the videos is you driving. Maybe you were driving a GT2 RS or mm-hmm. 3 RS. And then he was like, oh, yeah, like, he's a pro, and here's his YouTube channel. And then I look, and I'm like, oh, wow, like, you know, this guy is is racing, racing. <laughs> for, for <laughs> So, like, I, 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 a few questions. How many laps do you think it takes of the Nurburgring to get to the point that you were able to put the car on pole? And then where does all of the taxi driving fit into all this? Mm. The, the, the big scheme of things sure 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 uh so yeah question one how many laps i mean i was a yeah i was i was a sim racer from i remember getting my uh my wheel and pedals i did well in my exams so my parents said uh they, they very kindly said what would you like as a reward i wanted a wheel and pedals and that was in Oh, here we go. It must have been about 2007, 2008, something like that. And on that game, there was the Nordschleife. And I first drove the Nordschleife um, in 2016. So I reckon I was driving the Nordschleife for like eight years on the sim. And I remember my first lap, I went over with my friend and uh, we did a tourist fart and lap in my car. And I talked him around the whole lap. And it was my first ever lap around the place in reality. And he was like, how do you how do you know what's coming up? Like, it's just like a country road. Like, I have no idea what's coming up. I was like, this is, I've been driving this sim for a long time. So yeah, that was a big, benef- that was a big, almost like baseline. The fact that I knew the layout of the track. No matter how many drive- times you drive a car, uh, the track, sorry, on the sim, it doesn't give you an appreciation for the, the gradients, the bumps, the jumps, the blind crests uh, that, that are coming your way. So yeah, for anyone out there that's done a lot of sim driving, you have to yeah go to the circuit to really experience it, but it's a good baseline at least, anyways. Um, then off the back of that, I think I did about fifty laps or so uh, combined uh, of tourist fart and driving, which is the public driving sessions you can do uh, at the Nord- at the Nurburgring, um, and the racing that I'd done there as well. So it was about fifty laps, and then I was I was on pole. It was I counted it as like my fifteenth GT three lap, which was like ridiculous um so yeah that's r- a rough window i think 50 laps minimum really to get comfortable with the place um but you can never be comfortable with the place because as soon as you're comfortable or confident you're in the barrier i mean there's there's zero tolerance for error at the place and i done a lot of coaching around there and people say like how long do you think i need and yeah, on a Grand Prix circuit, you can you can do that repetition in a morning. You can do 50 laps in the morning and you'd be like, right, okay, I know where I'm going. I know where the breakpoints are. I know where the bumps are. I know where the limits are. But that's with 10, 15 corners. Um, yeah, when you replicate that to the, the 100 plus corners or 70 plus corners, whatever you want to count as a corner and not a corner, there's various numbers as to how many corners there are actually on the Nordschleife. Um 
yeah, that repetition just takes so much longer. So you do need, you do need a couple of days doing 20 laps in a day is like a big day, like on a track day, 20 laps, you, you're pretty knackered by the end of it, especially as a beginner. So you're looking at three days, full three full days driving to have, to be comfortable with the place uh, before then you really start to get into the detail and really start to um, uh, push the, be start to push the limits, I would say. Okay. To answer that question. Okay. Um, and then, and then the taxi driving. Um, I was coming, I was coming over more and more, and there was some resurfacing work done in the beginning of twenty nineteen, I believe it was. And at the time, at Apex, Tim Morley was one of the uh, taxi drivers, British guy that had moved from England to Germany. Uh, to to work for Apex and and drive taxis uh, as 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 his way of life, which was yeah mega. And I remember asking, I was like, right, I need to know what the new tarmac is like. I want to know how, how grippy it is. I want to know where the bumps are, if they're gone or not, which sections are, um, which are, sections are resurfaced. And this guy has done, he's done fifty laps already, uh, minimum. Uh, so he knows he's an expert already on on the track. Um, and I remember going for a drink with him. I bought him a drink and said like, uh, yeah, just want to quiz you and say, what do you think of this? I was looking for my own competitive advantage when it came to racing, uh, which is why I, I, I hunted him down. And then we stayed in touch. Tim's a really cool guy. We're, st we're still in touch now. Uh, we've raced together, um, in historic racing as well as, uh, he's a, he's a guy I can rely on. I can trust. Uh, he now lives back in the UK, but whilst he was over here, we kind of backed each other up where in when we were coaching, he could cover for me and I could cover for him. And we trusted each other with each other's customers. Uh, when it came to the taxi driving, uh, I could cover for him. And he, he yeah, that was probably the main reason. I, he never really covered for me because he was the main guy. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I mean, I got my assessment as it was from, from Tim. Tim sort of, gave me the okay to uh robert mitchell the boss of apex to say yeah Dave, david's good uh he's a safe pair of hands he's not trying to do anything stupid he's not trying to prove he's not got anything to prove which is one of the big things in tourist far and if you if you have a shunt it's because you're trying to prove something to someone or something that you that's in your mind that you want to that you want to yeah try and make a point and then as a result it causes an incident uh and when you're dealing with like a half a million euro car someone else's half a million euro car that the owner of that car wants to be, know that yeah you're not gonna you've not got a chip on your shoulder or you want to do anything that could endanger firstly his guest because he's liable for that guest and also his his car as well so uh yeah he gave me the okay and uh then robert uh sat alongside me uh, as well to give his personal okay and I was actually for I was on the day I, I was there the day I was only there sporadically only when I was racing I'd sort of pop in and do some sh shift work almost as it were so I wasn't permanently in Germany at the time um, uh, but I happened it, one of the race meetings happened to coincide with the arrival of the GT2 RS so I actually drove a lap of the Nordschleife with Robert before he drove his own car around the Nordschleife. Uh, so I remember that lap well, because he was like, right, come on, Dave, take me around. I'm like, are you not going to drive your own car first? He's like, nope, you know what you're doing, so you can show me. I was like, oh, here we go. <laughs> and like the GT2 RS is like my dream car. Like uh, as a road car, it's one of my dream cars and it's an uh, epic piece of kit. And it's just a, it's just a brute. Um, so yeah, but yeah, having the owner and the boss sat next to me, you have to have that respect for the opportunity you have in the first place. It's like ridiculous, uh, but also know that you are in a weapon of a car on the most dangerous circuit. Um, so yeah, you just have to build up to, to, to that limit and it takes its time. Um, and yeah, you, you, you just can't overstep that mark too, too much too soon. Um, and yeah, he gave me the all clear. And then I think it was the next day I was then in taking guests around and, uh, that was epic. What I love about racing is obviously and driving is, is, is my passion. I love to drive fast. I love to win. I love to be competitive. Um, but you don't really, you can't really share that with people within racing. Yes. You can share it with an endurance team because you're sharing the car, but it's only you in the car. And what I love about 
giving taxi rides is the fact that you can you ha- you have the ability to share it in the moment with that person and i'm not a taxi driver that just sits there and drives i'm giving a running commentary of this happened on this corner look out for this over here look out for that look at this bit of traffic that's coming up etc i really want to give the full experience to to my my passengers and my guests and just seeing and hearing their reaction is is uh, very re- rewarding and it's just uh, i feel lucky to share that opportunity and uh, i love the the feedback they get it sounds maybe a little bit arrogant uh, I don't want them to think, oh, David, you're a good driver. I just want them to appreciate what a car can do um, at its limit. And that's the thing that if they can get a kick out of that, then that's the best thing for me. And that's what I love sharing with because that's what I love as well. You have any cool taxi stories? Um, Yes. So the F80 M3, Sherma M3 that uh, Apex have. It's a race car with number plates, basically. You can race that car in the NLS Championship if you slap some numbers on the side and put some slicks on. Uh, it only ran in tourist fight, and so it always runs on road tyres. But it's got full roll cage. Uh, what's crazy about it is the fact that, yes, the driver and the passenger have full harnesses and bucket seats, but they've actually managed to fit harness and bucket seats in the rear of the car as well. So... It's like, uh, it like I said, it's a four door race car with number plates. Um, the black car, right? That's it. Yeah, black and gold. Yeah. Great color combo as well. Mm-hmm. And um, and yeah, it's very noisy. It's got a Drexler differential. Um, sort of, yeah, that just whines the faster you go. So it becomes very noisy. Obviously, big loud uh, exhaust on there as well. Sound deadening's gone as well. So it's the full race car experience, really. So you're all wired. You have to wear a helmet because it's a uh, roll cage. Uh, even though it's tourist fire, and you have to. Uh, you, you, if if anything were to happen, you don't want to bang your head on a roll cage. There's only going to be one winner there. So everyone has to wear um, a helmet. But you also have an intercom in that helmet for communication because it's so loud. So I remember my first lap, uh, but with Moritz Krantz as a who was doing a taxi ride with um, in the F80. And I sat in the back and I'm a very good passenger because I've been a driver coach for a long, long time. So I'm used to being flung around in the passenger seat and feeling slightly out of control, which I think is what people get motion sickness about. Uh, they're not fully in control. So they don't know what's quite happening next. So as a result, yeah, they they get, they feel ill. So sitting in the back of that car, I actually felt ill. And I was like, what? No, like I can't sit in the back of this car. I think it's just so enclosed and you don't have that big field of vision ahead of you because of the driver and the passenger seat. You do end up feeling, getting motion sickness. So that was the car that we were always going to get motion sickness in. And the car is prepared. It has sick bags in the car. So if you start to feel ill, you are advised to take the sick bag uh, and open the window. You kind of start to see where this is going. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, we're, we're, we're bombing around. There's three passengers in the car with me. And you have to check in on the passengers every so often to make sure everyone's okay. Um, but there's three guys. They're all friends. They're having fun. They're all talking between each other. So maybe I have my 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 headset turned down a little bit more than normal because I they're having their fun. I'm concentrating on my driving. And they're all speaking to each other as well through the intercom system. And uh, yeah, you just sort of give a thumbs up to everyone. Everyone kind of gives a thumbs up and you sort of looking, you look in the mirror. mirror. Okay. There's one thumb. Where's the other thumb? Everything. Okay. Ah, yeah, it'll be fine. I'll check in a few kilometers time. Uh, Drumming along. And then there's sort of a waving, uh, waving from the rear seat after a few kilometers. You're like, okay, right. What's going on? Turn the mic up. You okay? Oh, I feel a bit ill. Okay, right. We'll just open some windows. We'll slow it down a little bit. We'll try and um, make you feel a bit better and get to the end of the lap. Uh, but unfortunately, it was too little too late. And yeah, this guest started to be sick in their sick bag. But the the worst bit was that everyone's connected up by intercom. Oh. So in your ears, yeah. someone is retching and chundering. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, actually, I unplugged my intercom. I was like, I can't deal with this. I can't deal with the smell. And I can't deal with the noise of someone retching in my ears. So then it was like, right, fully slow the car right down. All four windows open. Get some fresh air in the car. 
And then after, again, a kilometre or so, plug back in the intercom and say, like, how's everyone feeling now? And kind of cruised it to the end of the lap. That's, <laughs> that's always the, the taxi story I tell. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, yeah, all right. Well, um, <laughs> the other thing I was going to add was how does it compare driving something like the GC3 RS or 2 RS to the actual the GC3 R race car? You know, a mm. lot of people always want to know how close is this street car for the road actually to the race car. And even though I haven't had the chance to drive either of those, I always try to remind people it's like, hey, the car being on slicks makes a huge difference, even mm. if the power is the same. But from someone who's driven both around a nervous. Yeah. I actually did a I did a uh, a comparison video of this of one of my M6 GT3 laps versus what at the time was the GT2 RS lap record, and you it's, it explains the the difference in the cornering speed and the top speeds basically. As you already mentioned, slicks is a big difference. I mean, your your cornering forces in a in a in a road car, anything over one G is like, like oh that's 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 a that car is handling really well like. That's a, a pretty amazing car. But like, yeah, GT3 cars are up at 2G cornering like quite easily. So when you think of that level of grip that's available in braking, accelerating, uh, combined acceleration and maximum lateral uh, acceleration as well. So cornering grip, um, it's just uh, it's just another it's just another animal. Uh, the suspension setup is then as a result tuned to that. So obviously your, your road cars are generally that little bit softer. And when we describe a car as being a little bit softer, it means that the there's there's a little bit more of um, an uncertainness to the body movement of the car. So um, you can't fully stiffen up the car because the tire would be overloaded the whole time. And as a result, it wouldn't provide the maximum grip. So having a softer car, uh, maximize it doesn't overload the tires too much. Um, therefore, the suspension is taking some of that load that the body is is transferring during cornering. But as a result, in that transfer of motion from left to right, from forward to back, um, it's a little bit more unpredictable because the platform is softer. So there is uh, a motion of rolling forward, back, sideways, etc. And, and a motion of unpredicted unpredictability. As a driver, you have to predict that the best you can and obviously adapt your inputs accordingly. So that you are controlling that uncontrolled phase, that that move, that um, weight shift, as we would call it. <clears throat> but then in the GT car, three car with slicks, um, everything is so much stiffer because of the higher levels of grip, uh, and that change of direction is so much more agile and aggressive because the tire can take the peak loading, uh, both in acceleration and in deceleration as well. So um, as a result, yeah, the car is so much more agile. You can be more aggressive with the steering inputs, the braking inputs, the acceleration inputs, and the combinations of the two. Uh, you can take almost more liberties. So, for example, you could almost say that yeah, driving on slicks, you could drive with a worse technique, and the outcome would wouldn't be as bad. But if you were to drive a bad technique on a road tire, the outcome would be would be worse effectively. Um, so yeah. But then when it comes to GT racing, GT3 car is actually, you could argue that it's underpowered and overgripped, whereas a road car is overpowered and undergripped. So that's why you see these big top speed differences. Some people will always ask, oh, how far does your race car go? And when I say 270 kph at the end of the dotting her straight, that's not, I mean, a Golf R could potentially do that like your 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 average sedan uh fast sedan an s4 uh, uh, an amg or, or whatever they're speed limited to like 250 k's or or, or 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 not much slower than 270 so but then we have the power restrictions within racing that the road cars don't so you could almost like i almost i've done quite a bit of historic racing where the emphasis is less grip more power so you can almost emphasize that a road car is 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 closer to that where you're going to lose traction more uh, quickly under power. Um, the braking distances are going to be bigger than um, than a than a race car. Um, 
So yeah, where am I going? Where am I going with this point? <laughs> Yeah, I'm just uh, just trying, trying to describe the differences, really. So that's that's the big thing. You're almost uh, in a slightly overemphasized fashion. A race car would be overgripped, underpowered, whereas a road car would be overpowered and undergripped. So speaking of like a GT3 car being underpowered, because I think for the most part everybody has about 500 horsepower. Of course, like BOP comes into play, but it seems 500 yep. number. So yep. what power amount do you think? would be uh, more equal with the, the performance to the grip, the, the power to the grip? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, it's, I mean, the more the, the more the better. Until you're breaking traction, until you're leaving big fat 11s out of like most corners, then uh, you need more power, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's what I love about historic racing. When you, you drive the AC Cobras and um, the Lola T70s, like traction is at such a premium that if you have even a few degrees of lock on the steering wheel, the, the rear end is sliding. That's, that's the perfect amount of uh, grip to power ratio, I think. And that's, that's man driving. That is when you drive those cars from the sixties, those were the, those were real boys. Those were like um, any kink becomes a corner and uh, you're driving the car potentially more with the opposite lock than you are with like precise steering. Um, yeah, that's proper racing, that is. <laughs> cool, cool. Okay. So now we'll get into the Aston Martin part of the program before we talk about your triumph at the Nürburgring last year. Uh, yes. So you didn't make the switch from uh, uh, <clears throat> to Aston. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I... When I came into GT racing, you you have to make a build a relationship with a manufacturer, which is why I was with Volkanhorst and BMW for four years or three and a half years, sorry. And in the winter, I used to fly to Munich. I used to arrange meetings with the big bosses from BMW Motorsport and knock on the door and basically be like, it was a very generic chat, but I made the effort to go down there to make sure they knew who I was and what I'd achieved that year so that they were considering me for their factory programs. It's all about timing as well as uh, opportun- uh, performances and opportunity. So there was never, uh, unfortunately, an opportunity for me at BMW. I did a shootout at the end of 2021 uh, with a few other young drivers, but none of us got hired into the, the factory program. So it kind of showed that there was there was no space. Uh, and as a result, um, I started to look elsewhere. Um, and because I wanted to become a professional driver, I couldn't. At this still in 2021, I was paying for my seat. And I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life. I, I I knew I had the ability to be a professional and I wanted to be rewarded for that. I was also coming up to being 30 years old, which these days I would say is actually quite old. Uh, and I was scared that it gets to a, got to a point where you have to kind of say, I was, I was earning my living through instructing and things like that and, and making ends meet at the end of the year, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a comfortable life. I would say uh, I, I wasn't, I wasn't starving. I, 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 I had a roof over my head and things like that. But when it comes to future planning, having zero savings at the end of the year, like you can't, you can't go on like that. So I needed, uh, that was my big driving force. So I want this to be a sustainable career. As we like to say, uh, you were sur- surviving, not thriving. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, a good way to describe it. Uh, absolutely. And, um, so yeah, that's why I was just pushing. I was like, I want to be a professional driver. I want to be a professional driver. I want to be a professional driver. So um, I was still a silver driver at this point. This is where it also gets very complicated when it comes to driver classifications. Uh, a bronze driver is generally a gentleman driver, an amateur driver. A silver driver is sort of a young professional or semi-professional. And then your gold and platinums are generally your uh, professional drivers. In the World Endurance Championship, the, um, the GTE AM category needs a combination of a bronze silver gold uh, champ uh, or platinum uh, driver so three drivers uh, of which i then fitted that was my unique selling point i'd done so much racing and i had some actually i had a terrible year in 2021 like we had no good results um that were worthy of much shouting about really and i think that was actually a blessing in disguise because that kept me silver even though I had the pace and the ability of a gold and 
that then allowed me to slot into the Northwest AMR World Endurance Championship program. Uh, I was put in contact to Aston Martin initially as a Nürburgring specialist, as they were bringing their car back to um, the, the Nordschleife with a pro effort. But then off the back, that was the first initial discussion. Then I said, I'm still a silver. Like, can I fit into your factory, uh, into your um, WEC program as well? And uh, they were like, oh, right. We didn't realize you were a silver. Like, yeah, we're always looking for fast silvers. So come and do a come and do a test and um, we'll see where you're at. And yeah, absolutely smashed the test. Was fastest of all the Aston drivers. Um, and yeah, got the seat for 2022 as a silver driver as a semi-professional in the world endurance championship which was mega again sharing with nicky team which was he's arguably one of the best talents again so i've been very fortunate with the uh people i've managed to share a car with and paul delalana who is one of the most successful businessmen and amateur drivers so i was immediately into a race a race winning lineup and yeah we won our first race at sebring the sebring thousand miles which was which was pretty impressive which was pretty crazy that we were immediately fighting for a, for a world championship. And um, yeah, then I was part of the, the factory lineup for um, for Aston Martin at Nürburgring, sharing with Maxime Martin, Marco Sorensen, and Nicky as well. Again, three incredible talents, which again, I was able to um, learn off of. Um, but yeah, I, I, being a specialist at the Nordschleife, I was able to lead pretty much lead those guys. Uh, I did the top qualifying for the car. Uh, because of my experience and pace around that, uh, I remember getting the call from the team boss and I was like, whoa, I've been chosen to do the qualifying shot against these like legends of drivers. This is, again, this is almost another a confirmation in my ability that I can do this and I can be on these on these levels. Uh, of which, yeah, I was able to, there's another tick in the box, basically. And yeah, we, which was, yeah, incredible. So we, we won at Sebring, we had a second at Spa, we had a, a podium at Le Mans. Uh, which was a dream come true in itself. Uh, we led the Nürburgring 24 hours for the first seven hours before we crashed on oil. Um, I did the Spa 24 hours. I did Daytona for the first time as well. So my dream events are the Daytona 24 hours, uh, Nürburgring 24, Le Mans 24, and Spa 24. I did them all in one year, which was unbelievable. Um, yeah, we finished second in the championship, uh, the World Endurance Championship as well, uh, which, yeah, again, elevated me again. At that point, the FIA saw that I was definitely not a silver. Uh, they upgraded me to gold, um, which then again, sort of, everyone was like, "Ah, oh, it's such a shame you update up, you're upgraded to to gold because of the opportunities a fast silver driver has." But I knew what I always wanted, which was to be a professional driver, and you have to be a gold or a platinum. So I just saw that as the next stepping stone. I didn't. Yes, there was a. A, a drop in opportunities for me but this was the next step where I had to prove myself again and find those opportunities uh to 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 prove again to to those people that I was the professional that I knew I was okay uh, so yeah that was 2022 uh 2023 um yeah I was building this relationship with Aston Martin unfortunately they had a very quiet year in 2022 uh then the there wasn't much factory rate there was no factory racing in fact there was no very little customer racing uh, and that uh, meant again i had to i had to uh, yeah i had to survive uh, which meant looking elsewhere and um, initially uh, yeah you can sort of survive on being um, with with on a, from a professional driving point of view but also the pro am point of view as well so I, 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 I like to think I'm quite a friendly person and I, I like to make friends with lots of people. I, I enjoy other races and uh, speaking with them and talking with them. So that network then came into handy when I was suddenly looking for opportunities uh, outside of, of Aston Martin. Um, I was very thankful for Heart of Racing who took me on for the IMSA long races, which was again, another step up. I'd done Daytona before I'd done Sebring thousand miles, but not the 12 hour. And I'd never been to um, road Atlanta either. So that was another box ticked where I've I'm, I'm increased my experience level with those guys. Um, and then, yeah, I contacted um, some people here at the Nürburgring that are all local. We're all kind of local, I suppose, really. Uh, Fricadelli Racing, they're 10 kilometers. Um, 
<laughs> six miles to you guys um, from the circuit. And um, uh, yeah, I rang them up and I said, if you're doing a pro-am lineup, which Klaus Ablen very regularly does, then please consider me for a, for a, pro, for, for a pro driver in that lineup. Again, looking to just try and earn some money to to um, to help <laughs> help my life help my life as it were, and uh, he was and then Klaus being a legend, he was like, no no no, we're not doing pro, and we're going we're going for a pro lineup. I was like, oh wow, cool, that's even better then. <laughs> he was like, yeah, I've got I've got uh, I've got Earl Bamber, I've got Nikki Katzberg uh, uh, on the car already, and I need uh, probably one or two more guys. I was like, wow, like <laughs> these guys already. Oh, and we're gonna run the new Ferrari. I was like, oh. Holy moly, like, this is really cool. Um, another consideration I took is the fact that when you look at customer racing, there were no opportunities with Aston Martin because there wasn't many customers out there driving the car. Porsche and Ferrari have the biggest customer racing, arguably. So I was like, right, I need to drive a Ferrari and a Porsche this year because that gains me the experience, which then will help sell me to gentlemen drivers that have Porsches and Ferraris, which will open doors for me. So that was one of the deciding factors. I had a few options for Nordschleifer and um, I was like, right, well, I can cover the Ferrari basis if I drive a Ferrari. So, and it's a pro lineup uh, that d it doesn't get much better than that. We're ticking all the boxes. So I went with Klaus for, for this year and yeah, it was a pretty accelerated timeline with the new car. Uh, trying to get it into the correct setup window, uh, making it comfortable for everyone. It's always tricky with a brand new car because as much testing as the factories always do, when it comes into customer hands in the real world, excuse me, there's always uh, things that the customers will find that the factories won't. And we were just like, oh no, we need to, we need to find all the faults and issues as, as quickly as possible. And yeah, it came together which was pretty incredible, pretty amazing. We knew we had a strong car going into the race weekend. Uh, our attitude was that we just had to execute with what we knew the car and the team were capable of. Uh, and yeah, I think we kept quite a cool head throughout the whole race weekend and stayed out of trouble, played our strategy. We, we knew our strategy two months in advance. Like We didn't defer from that. We knew what we were going to do and we executed it. We didn't... We weren't emotional and, and made rash decisions. Yeah, we just stuck to our plan uh, and it came together. I suppose the only the only the only plan that only pit that wasn't part of the plan was the puncture after about seven hours. I was like, oh, no, not again. I'm always scared to go to sleep in a 24 hour race when I'm when I'm not in the car, obviously, um, because there's been so many times where I've woken up and the cars had an issue and it happened again. I, I started the race. I did my sort of two hours. And then I was back in at like midnight. So I was like, right, I'm going to catch a couple of hours sleep whilst the other guys are driving uh, before I then start the night shift. And I woke up just as the car got a puncher. I was like, oh, for God's sake, not again. Uh, but luckily, like, it happened in the correct place, like a kilometre from the pits, which means we lost a minute, which actually in the grand scheme of things on 24-hour race is nothing. So we were like, right, this is our one bit of bad luck. And if this is our one bit of bad luck, this is our year. And like we just rode that kind of confidence for uh, the rest of the race. And yeah, came together and it was an epic, uh, epic result on so many levels. For myself, my first big 24-hour win, uh, something that I've been striving for forever. Uh, it was the first time Klaus won the 24 hours. He's been trying for 20 years. Uh, it was the first time since uh, his partner, Sabine Schmitz, uh, passed away who was uh, who's arguably queen of the ring. Yep. So that was a, a huge emotional connection. We had Sabine's mother in the garage as as I crossed the line to finish the race. Uh, and yeah, they, they're almost like this. this the, it was almost like driving for Sabine Spitz's family team, really. So to, to kind of have that, I get goosebumps thinking about now the hairs on my neck are standing up. Uh, so and I think the Frickadella team has such a following around the Nordsch life as well that um, it was almost like a fan favorite win. So there were so many levels that it was just the right thing that happened. And yeah, we had a massive party that night and it was awesome. And the whole weekend lived up to what I wanted and expected and more. If if I'm correct, isn't that also Ferrari's first win for N24? Oh, yes, true. Yes, well, there, there was two other aspects, which was it's the first non-German manufacturer for 21 years. 
it was the first time Ferrari's ever won the Nord- the Nurburgring 24 hours and we set a distance record as well so it was the fastest race in history as well so there was crazy amounts of boxes to tick <laughs> oh. now you had a chance to drive three different GC3 cars over the course of the year you drove the Ferrari you drove the Aston uh, even well, if you consider the year before, like the car didn't change, the, the advantages, mm. and you drove the new 992 GT3R as well. So mm-hmm. these three cars compare, and also, of course, you drove the M6. But mm. uh, if well, if you want to throw all four together, how does it compare driving four different cars in the same class? Um, which one did you yeah. like? Which one? suited your driving style better i know aston is is you, so you might be inclined to say <laughs> the vantage is the the best of the bunch but uh you know objectively talk talk to us about the pros and cons of these four and how they compare um so i started with front engine cars the m6 and the aston were both front engine cars and i kind of slowly worked my way backwards we then went to the Ferrari mid-engine and then finally the Porsche rear-engine. So um, that was quite an interesting comparison in itself. Generally, when you think about it and what you what you see and hear from other drivers is that those mid-engine cars are much more... They're quite shorter wheelbases than the, the front-engine cars. M6 is always a big... It's a bit of a ship, really. Very long, very wide, a very stable in high speed, but a bit of a boat in the slow-speed corners. Um, whereas you look at the Lamborghinis, the Ferraris, uh, the Porsches, um, the Audis, they're all very agile in the slow speed, but actually on the edge in the high speed. So, um, that's what I was most aware, aware of when I firstly went from the Aston to the Ferrari. Um, but then they all have their pros and cons. Everyone... All the car, everyone says, what's the fastest car, what's the best car? But they all achieve the same lap times. But it is true that they all achieve them in such different ways. The Aston and the, the BM has their have their advantages in the high-speed corners, medium and high-speed corners, where they're, because they're a, bit, a little bit longer, if if you start to have a moment where the rear is is slipping and, and moving, that that you, you get a feeling sooner that or that, you feel that rotation, that your moment, that sliding moment of the car, but it's happening over a longer distance. So you have more time to catch the car. And we're talking like fractions of a second here, but you still feel more comfortable in those higher speed um, corners. So you can maximize the car there. But you just under the car just understeers through the slow speed stuff. So you're just constantly waiting on the front axle. Whereas the mid the mid engine stuff is almost a compromise. It's your traditional sports car layout. Uh, where they kind of do both areas pretty well. Uh, the Porsche obviously argue has very good braking traction, um, but it's actually a bit of taboo when it comes to automotive design. Having the engine that far out the back, it becomes this huge weight, this huge pendulum effect. So any sliding you do have is massively emphasised, and you you can't really drift a Porsche. <laughs> You can give it a go, but it's pretty tricky because of all that weight in the background. You really that unpredictableness I was kind of speaking about earlier on, uh, of the the weight movement, the weight transfer is just massively emphasized with all that weight in the rear. So yeah, you just have to maximize the car in their strengths and then make the best of the car in in their weaknesses, really. Um so yeah, the Ferrari was was very good in the slow speed. So the Grand Prix circuit on the Nordschleifer. Uh, we were happy with the way it changed direction. It was quite nimble. I was a little bit wary of the high speed, but then the aerodynamic package on the car, uh, it's, it's a, I believe it's a carbon chassis. So it's very torsionally stiff, uh, which means there's no flexing in the chassis. So a metal chassis, there's always, there's a lot of load going through the metal chassis. And as a result, it's flexing. So there's this, again, is even more uncontrolled movement that you as a driver from the seat of your pants, you're feeling, which is not giving you confidence. But having this car, this this much stiffer tub that the Ferrari runs, it uh, everything's much more, there's, there's none of that unpredictableness. Every, all the feedback you're getting is kind of true feedback effectively. So and the and cu- coupled with the aerodynamic package, it um it it com- it um overcame that high speed instability I was expecting the 
mid-engine car to have. Um, so it was very good. Um, and then moving on to the Porsche, that was probably the most fun to drive, actually. Like, when you, when you look at the first two, the the further forward the engine is, the more understeer the car is. So again, that unpredictableness because of where the mass is is shifted forward. So the 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 front end becomes a little bit more vague on the front engine cars because it's having to deal with all that weight on the front axle. Those tires are really getting worked hard. The mid the mid engine uh, is is in the middle, and then the rear engine uh, is. The opposite so you're you're potentially overloading the rear axle much sooner than you are the front axle so the rear end's always moving and i remember driving the porsche for the first time we had our pre-race meeting and it was a six hour race which meet two drivers so we were going to have to do three hours each and normally i like to do two hours early get that big stint done out of the way whilst i'm fresh and then i only have to do one hour at the end of the race uh, but then all the drivers looked at me. They're like, you want to do a double stint? And I was like, yeah, it should be fine. I, I, I class, uh, I, I, I class myself as a very fit individual. So I was like, yeah, two hours, easy peasy, no dramas. And they're like, no, you should do a single day of like single, single, single is the way forward. I was like, well, you're, you're, you're the experts in the car and the team. So I'm not going to go against you. And I'm glad they did. They told me to do that. Cause my word, like just uh, the, the car is always moving the braking is incredibly impressive because obviously under weight transfer, all the weight is shifting forward, but with the Porsche, all the weights at the back. So the car is incredibly stable there, but because all that weight's at the back, there's no weight on the front axle, which makes it quite difficult to turn when you're off the pedal. That's why you have to off the brake, which is why you hear the, everyone saying you have to trail brake a Porsche to keep the weight on the nose, to make it turn. So you have to do that. There's such a fine line between too much and too little, which means the rear is like always on the edge and you almost have to over rotate the, the, and then when you get off the brake and then get on the power, the rear of the car sits down, which gives you incredible traction, but you almost have no steering at the front axle because the front, there's nothing on the front and it's pointing in the air because of that weight transfer. Yeah. And as a result, you are literally like almost like speed boating. We would describe it as like a speed boat would, would drive along the sea out of the corners. So you have to over rotate the car in the entrance, get everything done on the way in whilst you're still on the brake, which means being really on the edge and then just sit the car down and then almost speedboat out of the corner and maximize the Porsche traction that it has, which is kind of fine on a low speed corner because if it's moving in a low speed corner, you've got a bit more time to kind of comprehend what's going on and, and catch any slides you've got. But obviously the faster you get, the more on the edge it's got. Um, I remember driving the Nordschleife uh, and thinking, I am not comfortable driving this car like in these medium and high-speed corners because the rear just kind of had a mind of its own. Mm. I think it comes down to the incredibly aggressive suspension geometry and camber, uh, camber gain or bump steer or whatever's designed into the car to make the car turn all before the apex makes it incredibly uh, agile. I'd almost, you, I don't know, I've I've heard as fighter jets as being just described as being designed as aerodynamically in instable or unstable so that they can maneuver better in a dogfight. And that's how I describe the Porsche because it was almost designed to be unstable to overcome this this inherent flaw in or flaw or inherent uh, car design that the Porsche has of all that um weight in the rear end effectively. So but it means you're sliding the car around, which was which was quite exciting. Um, and no two corners are kind of the same as a result of it. Whereas the Ferrari is potentially more clinical. You can be much more repeatable with that mid mid engine layout. And the Aston is you're dealing with, uh, and, and the, the BMW you're dealing with uh, understeer the whole time. So um, you're almost limiting the amount of understeer you've got or um, every lap. So understeer is boring anyways. So yeah, uh, having the most amount of, um, but then again, they, they're all as quick as one another. They all have the potential to go as fast as one another, but they just do it in such different ways. Uh, and yeah, I just find myself, what I love watching my onboards back, uh, no matter how old they are. And the Porsche one, I always find myself watching, thinking, Whoa, Dave's on the edge there. His heart rate is up. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Okay. So I guess to step away from the nerve ring a little bit and look at your relationship with Aston Martin. So... The first year, you pretty much were 
a works driver, but not like full blown factory. I was just just associated with mainly Northwest AMR. So I was a driver employed by Paul Dallalana to drive and wreck. Okay. So yeah. you talk to the, the people at home about the difference between uh, your relationship with that team versus you now being a full blown Aston factory driver. Like what does yes. that mean to, to the people at home? Mm. So um, I kind of mentioned about building a relationship with a manufacturer in the past, which I tried to do with, with BMW. Um, 2022 was the start of my opportunity to build this relationship. Uh, yes, I did well in the, in the, the, the single test that I did. Um, it showed a, a good amount of pace on one day, the best that there was out of the drivers that they tested. And as a result, uh, yeah, I got the seat. But the big thing for me in what factory drive uh, factories look for in drivers is the consistency, the ability to be the best on the day, day in, day out, year in, year out, basically. So as much as I'd like to have thought, oh yeah, I'm just going to jump in and just get a factory seat. Even though I'd been doing kind of good performances in BMW, you have to you have to perform against their own benchmarks. So in BMW, I was sharing with factory drivers. I was performing against those benchmarks. But when you change manufacturer, the manufacturers don't know what these other drivers are like because purely have never worked with them one-to-one. -one. They don't know the, the, the true picture. They want to rely on their own data, which is fair enough. So yeah, partnering with with Nikki, uh, who's had such a, a long career with Aston, anyways. Um, he's their benchmark, so it was the perfect person for me to jump in with, especially and also with the guys uh, on the on the the Nurburgring car as well. So um, yeah, as with everything in motorsport, there's a sporting aspect, there's a business, and there is a business slash uh, political aspect as well. So you have to be the right guy. Um, as well as obviously trying to be as quick as Nikki, I was also uh, driver coaching Paul Dallalana as well. So as a professional driver, you can't just be quick and then just leave your amateur to sort them out, the, the, your bronze driver to sort themselves out. You have to, um, you have to bring the package uh, together. You have to see the big picture that it's not all about just yourself as a, a single professional. You have to, um, you have to bring the team forward so whether that's the engineering department or all your co-drivers uh, you're all working towards a common goal and if you can help all the parts of the puzzle come together and 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 um and, and uh, obtain the best result then that's 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 the uh, that's the epitome of being a professional driver i would say whether you're factory or not doesn't matter uh but th that's what i tried to really emphasize during 2022 uh, so yeah, I was there as a as part of a customer customer program, um, and I was involved in some factory supported programs, but I wasn't directly associated with the factory. I could have I could have driven, gone off and driven any manufacturer that I wanted. Basically, um, my interest was was still with myself to to do what was best for me, uh, whether that was from a performance or from a business or a political um, aspect. So yeah, you are playing the field a bit, really as well as speaking to Aston, you're speaking to other brands, you're speaking to other manufacturers. You can't, you can't just put all your eggs in one basket. So throughout 20, uh, 2022 and 2023, I was consistently speaking with bosses from other manufacturers saying like, I'm here. Do you need me? Can I, can I help you? Can I do this? Uh, can I do that? Um, I have a customer that wants to try a Porsche. I have a customer that wants to try a Ferrari. Can you help? Can you help me sort this? Basically it's all, all about that business and sporting combination um uh yeah so whereas now um i had some offers this winter uh, i chose aston martin as i believe we have the most strategically aligned goals to to uh, win big races and win big championships uh and i feel that they they really value my 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 abilities as a professional as a, a driver coach uh, and, and as a brand ambassador and um, so, so now my, my allegiance is fully behind uh, Aston Martin. Motorsport can be quite a fickle business where you're, you're literally surviving year to year. Um, the short term contracts when, in the grand scheme of things. But uh, Aston also showed loyalty by offering me a multi-year contract. So uh, I am 
I'm now committed to Aston for for multiple years. Uh, it's not just a flash in the pan relationship. This is hope. This will be uh, a relationship that we can build for longer term, to not just try and obtain good results this year, but build programs that uh, will obtain um, race and championship winning results for years to come as well. So uh, that's where I would say probably the big difference is between yeah, professional associated driver and a, and a factory driver is your, your your eggs are now all in one basket and you are really working towards not just your your own personal goals but the goals of the team you're associated with and the brand you're associated with well what i hope and of course you know maybe you also had the same idea but i hope you get to get a chance to drive the valkyrie uh, now that they've announced that actually they will do EMSA and WEC. And yeah. yeah. It's, it's a good time to be a part of Aston Martin brand, which, uh, yeah, that was also, uh, yeah, a contributing factor to the decision. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of Valkyrie, I know you had a chance to drive a streetcar. Could you talk to us what that's all about? Because, like, right about now, that's probably about my favorite car. <laughs> like, there, there's other things, of course, that I love, but it's just such a crazy idea to actually pull it off. And <laughs> I would say, like, if, you know, the aliens came to Earth and were like, oh, we need something to drive, that's exactly what they would drive. It's a Valkyrie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I was involved in some of the road car development uh, test driving, effectively. So just on proving grounds, um, operating various tests that required a professional driver. So, um a lot of the development driving is done by the engineers who are capable drivers in themselves. But when it comes to sort of on the limit testing, that's when you, you require someone whose, whose career has been based around yeah, professional high performance driving effectively. So this involved like V max runs. So running the car up to like 200 and 240 mile an hour, for example, um and then high speed handling runs as well um yeah all all the bad stuff all the all the terrible jobs that no one wants to do uh so yeah that was really cool especially the high speed stuff because i've never been that is the fastest car i've ever driven and it's the fastest speed i've ever obtained uh so when people start to say yeah what's the fastest car you've driven it's not 200 170 miles an hour in my race car it's now 240 miles an hour in a valkyrie uh, and yeah, it's absolutely epic, to be fair. I've also thought about this, like when I've tried to describe it to people. So one of my favorite films at the moment is Top Gun Maverick. And in the first, one of the first scenes when he dry, uh, flies the Dark Star, that is what it's like driving a Valkyrie. Like the preparation process, he puts the helmet on, they they do those sort of warm up fitness tests, they bolt him into it. And they, you run through that whole startup procedure of like left engine ignition, right engine ignition, all that stuff like that. And uh, you're constantly in communication with both your team and the proving ground um, uh, communication um, uh, who runs the site. So it's almost like that pilot to air traffic control communication going on as well. And yeah, it's a big thing. Like you're you're pushing the boundaries of what the car and what cars in general can do not just this incredibly special car but there's not many cars that can do what this what the valkyrie can do so it's very special when you jump in the car and do that and uh yeah you get given the all clear that they know when you're doing v max runs they clear the, the the entire bowl or the, the 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 oval that you're running on because it's you can't have the speed differences that you have when you're sharing it with other cars uh, so yeah, you're you're given this okay. You're given this time slot window of which you have this exclusive hire that you have to um, um, uh, achieve the test, uh, and then and then you go out and do it. And uh, yeah, it's a very it's a special feeling. Um, the the yeah, the performance capability is the closest what's come to uh, a race car. When you start to when you when you asked me earlier on about what's the difference between a GT3 RS, GT2 RS, and and a race car. Um, the Valkyrie again starts to blur those lines with the amount of power and downforce it has. It's still limited by a road tire 
and that's what you really feel in the braking and cornering and traction um but that uh that car starts to blur the lines between road cars and gt3 cars i would say oh yeah hopefully one day it could be you in the, the amr pro i could be passenger with you <laughs> yes it's just because you can put a passenger seat in that thing that is just ridiculous isn't it yeah, yeah. When, you think, when you think about it it's madness yeah. two laps around silverstone you know that'd I, be enough yeah <laughs> <laughs> that would do it that would do it um so just a few more questions do you plan on making a return to youtube <laughs> yes that's a good question a lot of people ask me that i i do have like raw footage from or i i stopped doing uh youtube end of 2021 because when i started to become associated with aston martin as a as a factory and not a customer driver uh i wasn't sure what i can could and couldn't show so one of the big things about my youtube channel i think people love is the onboards and that uh immersiveness but when you're at this level of competition there is then a level of security and 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 data security that you that you have to appreciate from a competitive element so and i think that kind of takes away what was unique about my channel and that immersiveness and i'm a type of person that i'm going to do it properly i'm not going to do it at all and unfortunately it's meant that it's 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 become not at all so i do have kind of raw footage from my own um and I've made them into kind of clips for my own uh, video diary. Effectively, I love watching the old stuff back and seeing, seeing reliving race weekends and seeing how I was to sort of how I am now and 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 things and, and there's stuff I've definitely forgotten about. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There's still on boards I can post. So yeah, we'll have to we'll have to do that, won't we? At least some on boards, at least anyway. So yeah, watch yeah. this space. Okay, all right. Um... Of course, we are both members of iZone. Uh, how have you felt iZone has helped you develop into the driver you are now? Mm. Uh, I think it got to the end of 2020 when I was with, I just finished the season sharing with all these factory drivers and I just felt I needed another input. I wanted, I I, I felt I, I'm good at self-coaching. I'm very disciplined with myself. I'm very driven, motivated, determined. But I needed a second opinion uh, and I'd kind of dabbled with iZone before, before I'm not, I'm at a level where I don't need someone like over my shoulder or a whole, whole race weekend. But what I appreciate the most about John Pratt, who's the Scott head coach there at iZone is his second opinion. He sees drivers um, uh, five days a week of all different levels uh, his big sort of the big star on his CV is the fact that he was coached to Andy Prio during his um, multiple European and world touring car um, winning era, um, three time world champion, European uh, champion, all with BMW Motorsport. Um, so I know that he's he's worked with one of the best that there has been in GT and touring car racing. So um that's the big draw for me. And that's what I love is I know what I'm, I'm pretty good at giving self-assessment about myself, what's good and bad, but I wasn't necessarily clear on how I could improve, make those bad things better and become a better version of myself, basically. So that's why I appreciate the most about iZone. And I love the, I love the accountability as well. It's not like, oh yeah, I'll go to the gym yeah oh no i didn't do it today i'll go tomorrow or i'll, I'll do do this on the sim I'll, I'll do it tomorrow it's you have to sort of own up and say oh, okay i didn't go to the gym i didn't go on the sim uh and those are the 0.0001 percent which add up to the one percent and these that's the level i i personally am dealing with at the moment um one percent improvement is is going to be huge at the level i'm at so yeah i'm just looking for all those um small percentages to add up um i don't know if you're aware of the, uh, being a cyclist you're not sure if you're aware of the sky cycling team dave brailsford but marginal gains is 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 my big thing so uh, that's 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 what i get the most out of my zone yeah yeah absolutely i mean it, it's been great for me so far i mean even like the mental things have helped outside of racing and yeah and, and regular life so yeah definitely 
I, there's uh, a, there's it's, it's great skills to have. Absolutely, you know, and a good chance to go last year to actually drive on the sim and participate in person with everything. Mm. It was a great experience. Mm. So yeah, good, I'm, good. I'm <laughs> Glad you get the most out of it. Good. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Gartrell, you you had anything else you wanted to talk to David about? No, it's been a it's been a actual pleasure to hear you know about like your experiences and and it's been really insightful. Um, thank you so much for. No for worries. Sharing. Been, I'm glad you've been quite quiet in the corner there. So uh, I hope I can yeah. answer all of your questions. I like to talk, and I know we've. We've lasted <laughs> way past the one hour that we initially planned. But uh, I, I knew that was going to happen because I'm always just talking, talking, talking. Because, yeah, any excuse to talk about cars and, and racing, then I'm on it. So, yeah, I, hopefully I covered all of your questions as well, Gatro. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, definitely. Um, nice one. But yeah, no, we, we definitely look forward to seeing uh, what your plans are for this year. Of course, we would love to have you on again. Uh with the trophy in the background, maybe this <laughs> or so once uh, you're done putting everything together in the house. But yeah, it's, it's been absolutely great to talk to you. Uh, it's always nice to get the perspective of someone. Uh, you know, like a, a lot of drivers now, you find they come from wealthier backgrounds, or maybe they spent the whole time driving formula cars, and to talk to somebody who has reached factory status which is what ultimately everybody is looking for but didn't take the uh you know the traditional traditional route and even having mm. times like you said uh you didn't have the money and then you had to figure it out pull things mm -hmm. together be resourceful then make things mm -hmm. happen as opposed to just you know oh let me just go cut another check <laughs> you mm. know that's not it's not always realistic for uh, everybody who's trying to make it, but you do absolutely. Provide, you do provide a sense of hope that you can actually get this done, and you can you can make things happen, even when the cards are stacked up against you. you yeah, know, absolutely. Take away this one uh, something that even got from another podcast we had did. You have to show up, never give up. You know, you always got to be persistent, be consistent. And believe in yourself, you can make a lot of things happen. Absolutely, no, couldn't couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, um, I don't I don't want to sound too big headed, but yeah, if if there's if there's a way to like yeah show people that yeah it's not it's not all perfect. It's definitely not always perfect, but yeah, if you yeah do those things exactly what you said, stay committed, and I still argue stay obsessed. Um, you you you'll make it happen. The uh, don't make a plan B. I agree with you there. <laughs> That's my big, big, big thing, definitely. Oh, yeah. But thanks for listening, folks. It's another podcast. Of course, we're hoping to have more guests on as the as the year goes on. And stay tuned. Hopefully, uh, I can meet David in person. So maybe we'll make that happen this year. <laughs> yep, sounds good, mate. I'll keep you posted when I'm in the States. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the Pit Box Podcast. We'll talk to you guys soon.